Thank you so much, Wendy, and welcome to another exciting Firebyte session. Thank you so much. I've received quite a few emails in the, um, over the last month or so, giving me ideas on what to do for future topics. So absolutely, keep those ideas coming. Again, we want to just make your time the most valuable and give you those tips and tricks as a network engineer uh, that you need to be able to uh, secure your environment as well as make the most out of your um, watch card uh, infrastructure. So today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, integrating Active Directory. Now as we talk about this, uh, um, interestingly enough, it comes up as a uh, fairly often question as I'm going through talking about the power of dimension and all of a sudden users start seeing or network engineers start seeing the power of um, the SSO integration when they see the usernames versus just IP addresses. As you're well aware, a lot of times your IP address changes and it's not easy to necessarily correlate uh, an IP address to a username. I came out of an infrastructure where we had about 3,000 IP addresses, so you can imagine memorizing all of that would have been a very difficult and impossible um, task to find out which IP address belong or correlated to what user. So as we talk today about a background of um, the agenda for today is the background on Active Directory or AD integration. We're going to talk about some of the uses that you can use of that Active Directory integration. Um, we're going to go into uh, using it for SSL, using it for policies, using it for um, the administration management. We're going to look at an overview of the integration, and then most of you that um, have been on before know I like to throw the slides out and go into a hands-on environment and show you a real-time uh, how that impacts your environment and how to set that up. We're going to go over some basic uh, troubleshooting tips for Active Directory integration, and then we're going to um, look at uh, configuring a VPN setup, setup as well as the administration or the admin users uh, tying into Active Directory. So just a little bit of background on Active Directory integration. Um, just to clarify, Active Directory and SSO um, single sign-on complement each other. So when, when they're, um, I'm getting their questions from uh, people looking at Dimension reports and saying, how can I uh, create or have that correlate to usernames? That's actually the single sign-on component for that. And a single sign-on is the seamless identification of users as they log on to computers. And again, if you haven't been aware of the agenda, we're going to be covering the SSO component uh, next month. Just to recap, SSO assigns users to those IP address for policies and reports. So then um, once we have the users identified, we can now look at the Active Directory integration um, so without Active Directory integration, it's really only helpful for those dimension reports. Um, once we do have the Active Directory configuration, we can start building policies. Now, as you see here, um, uh, typically with WatchGuard, you have your IP address, as you can see on the screen. We don't have a user assigned to it. Now, with a single sign-on, we automatically assign or we see that administrator and there's a number of ways we'll get into that next month how we can uh, get this user identification correlated to an IP address. So with the Active Directory integration, it allows you to create policies based on Active, Active Directory users and groups. Now we do support um, other uh, databases as well. However, I've seen um, from a myriad of different organizations, the Active Directory is one of the more popular um, ways. It allows you to uh, uh, authenticate users to the VPN and the authentication uh, portal. It allows you to have network admins log into the firewall dimension with uh, Active Directory credentials. So those are just some of the ways that we can um, have that uh, tie-in as well. And as you can see here with this policy, I still see a lot of organizations building policy based on any trusted or any IP address or a specific IP address range rather than moving into uh, a way where we can tie directly into their Active Directory group. And as we can see here, we've taken it away from any trusted and in this uh, sample we're moving into 
for instance, a bank environment where maybe the managers have one set of policies and then the bank tellers have another set. So in this case, we're building policy based on the Active Directory uh, managers group. And then if Sally belongs in the managers group, she's going to get that uh, policy as well. So some of the benefits of the Active Directory policy integration, obviously, one of the more common ones is different groups can have different policies. So as we look at that bank environment, bank managers can get the Facebook while limiting YouTube to two megabits per second. Or we might want to give another policy to bank tellers where they can't get the Facebook, they can't do uh, social media, we want them extremely secured down, and they can't stream uh, YouTube. So in any environment where you have multiple tiers of um, a policy, Active Directory integration is hands down the way to go because if you base it on, for instance, an IP address, and all of a sudden that IP address changes because of DHCP or whatnot, all of a sudden you don't, you have a, more of a Swiss cheese model of uh, security where you have all kinds of holes in your um, firewall. Now as you look at some of the other ways, other uses of Active Directory integration, as I mentioned before, it allows you to authenticate users to VPN. Uh, so whether or not they're doing IPsec or SSL, and oftentimes I get a question, what can uh, WatchGuard uh, terminate a VPN to? And um, so if you're wondering about that, basically anything that a Cisco uh, VPN can uh, terminate a session with, WatchGuard can do the same. Um, so it allows you to authenticate users, going back to Active Directory integration, the authentication portal. Um, allows you to have network admins uh, log into the firewalls, and allows you, again, to create policies based on Active Directory users or groups. Now, some of the more interesting, I broke that out for you, because a lot of times we're so focused on um, our internal traffic outbound, and certainly that's a great use of using those policies for Active Directory users and groups. But I've also seen um, instances where maybe you want to have a remote administration of your firewalls, but you don't want to just open it up to the world um, for a good cause. Now what you can actually do is, using port 4100, as you see there, you can authenticate externally and then have those policies built for that. So in essence, not that I would recommend it, but um, for those of you that are running, for instance, uh, RDP over um, 3389 open to the world. Um, so for starters, that's a very bad idea uh, because it's all plain text and there's all kinds of vulnerabilities for that. But in the event that you needed to have some sort of um, quote unquote poor man solution for that, you could actually say, you know what, let's have our users authenticate to port 4100 first, and then we're going to open up 3389 to them afterwards, and I'll, we'll go over that as well. So while a lot of this is focused on uh, internal traffic, having policies uh, for internal traffic going outbound, we can also create those policies um, coming in as well into your environment. Now as we look at um, the overview of Active Directory integration, so obviously you must have a Windows Server with Active Directory services installed. Um, and then you must specify an Active Directory authentication server. And then you need to, um, and I have the locations for that, and feel free as you're uh, looking at this or maybe you come across this, uh, this presentation at a later date. If you want these slides, absolutely, I'll send them right over to you as well as um, we'll just post it on YouTube. So to specify an Active Directory authentication server, you just go into Setup Authentication, Authentication Servers, and all of this will start to make sense as we throw out the slides and move into a live environment. And then we want to add a user or group to the authorized users and groups list. Now, um, what I do recommend from that is that it is uh, case sensitive and must be matched 100%. So case sensitive, space sensitive, what have you. What I like to do, and I'll show you um, uh, in a few seconds, is just go into ADSI Edit grab that, um, uh, or actually users and groups, 
grab that full name and then just copy and paste it out of there and into your WatchGuard firewall. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and move into a hands-on setup, see how this is um, set up in real time, and we'll go from there. So as you, many of you um, realize, I love my virtual environment. Uh, this is my, let me get the, my slide deck out of the way. I'm running um, ESX. I have my environment here actually running the latest Dimension 2 uh, beta. If you haven't seen it, uh, definitely uh, hold on to your pants because it's going to be a, a, a great new product. Um, uh, you're going to be blown away by the power of that. But um, within there, I have my uh, virtual firewall and then my Windows server as well. So as we look at that, um, your Windows server, I'm going to just show you here. So this is actually running the latest um, code on this. Let's look at, take a look at this real quick. This is running um, 11.10.1 uh, as a beta on here. But looking at your um, policy manager and going into that, so this is my, I apologize, let me slow down here for a second. This is my Windows server um, that I'm running here. I have my Active Directory. Um, which is watchguard-lab.com. I have my built-in users. It's pretty vanilla at this point, uh, everything that I've done in my environment. Now the first step I want to do is go ahead and tie my firewall into the um, Active Directory integration component of that. Now, um, as I did mention, it is, uh, and let me repeat that, it is relatively vanilla at this point. So we just go under Setup Authentication we have authentication servers. We also have a number of other components that we can do from here. We have authorized users and groups. That's where we set up the uh, groups for that, and we'll, we'll cover that. Web server certificate. So this covers if you did want to be able to authenticate um, externally. Uh, let's say you're at home and you wanted to be able to manage your WatchGuard firewall, rather than just have that um, ports available to the World Wide Web, what we can do is just open up the authentication portal 4100, um, then uh, you would be able to authenticate on there. Now, if you're from home, uh, one of the things that I would recommend is getting a web server certificate so you're not uh, getting those server certificate errors. Now, if you're like any other IT department I've seen, you put in a uh, server that has a temporary certificate, and then as a testing environment, all of a sudden your beta now becomes in the production. And I would really caution you against having training those users to be able to click on, um, you know, if they have certificate errors, to be able to click on trust or continue because, in essence, those security precautions are there for their own protection. And if we're um, bringing on... Um, uh, testing environments, and now we're training our users to click on. Now we're also training them if they were to come into a situation where a website was hacked and it was an invalid certificate, and they click on continue, uh, their uh, username and password could be uh, compromised. So you can upload a web server certificate um, through here. But for this sake, we're going to go into uh, authentication servers component. So from here, we can actually... This is, when we talk about Firebox, this is the internal database on the, uh, the firewall. So in the instance that we didn't want to do Active Directory integration, we just wanted to have um, a few users be able to authenticate, we can certainly do that simply by adding in users with a password here. We can give them um, groups as well internally. We have uh, timeout limits as well for them. We have Radius, a Secure ID. LDAP, and then Active Directory as well. So in this case, we want to just go ahead and let's say we were doing um, a new domain and we wanted to tie into, for instance, our domain controller of, let's say, watchguard.com. Simply add in the domain name. We can add in IP addresses. Um, and obviously, if you are a larger organization where you have multiple um, domain controllers, you can put those, tie those into the um, ports as well. Now, right off the bat, this does default to um, uh, unsecure LDAP. You can enable LDAP S uh, simply by clicking on here. Just make sure that your uh, domain controller is set up for that. But in this case, I want to go ahead and review 
what I have spe um, specified for watchcard-lab.com. This is our search base. So one of the easiest ways, uh, if you've worked with Active Directory, you know this um, sort of uh, setup here. One of the easiest ways to be able to get that, let me just close out and show you how to get in there, is through a little program called ADSI Edit. So we can simply get there um, by going um, start, and then we simply type in ADSI Edit. We're going to connect to, um, let's go ahead and connect to my um, domain controller. If you had multiple domain controllers, you could connect to those as well. But in this case, we want to look for those. Um, so now we're specifying the search base. In my setup, I just said anyone in my organization should be able to authenticate against my firewall. So I can simply grab that from here, or I could actually go into properties, go into the distinguish name, and just copy and paste this um, into your organization or into your Active Directory um, setup on your WatchGuard. I've seen so many cases where people just um, uh, do a typo or um, have extra space in there. To just copy and paste eliminates that um, method for um, or any chance of error on that. And then we're Excuse me, gonna, Johan. Yes. Excuse me, j just one moment. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions. If, if, is it possible to maximize your screen? Some folks are having trouble reading it. On this one, it is not. Um, okay. Well, because it, sorry, let me change my, let me see. And I apologize, that's one of the, um, the problems of having a virtual environment. And thank you, Wendy, for um, bringing that up. Let me just go ahead and do this real quick here. Let's see if I can maximize that um, out a little bit. So screen resolution. Let me just drop that down. We'll do 1280 by 720, see if I can take that. All right, let's see if this is better. Again, my apologies for that. And now it appears. One second here. And now I've lost my window. Let's go into try that again. Now I don't have scroll on here. Okay. Um, well, hopefully you can see that. I'll try to get by without scroll. I've, I've taken that off the side. And I've, again, my apologies, but hopefully this is easier for you to see. We have our search base here. Um, you yes. Sorry. Um, it's now uh, just a blue screen. Okay. How about that? There we go. Oh, that is much better, and it's it's much bigger. Thank you. Yeah, so hopefully I don't need scroll because I, I'm going to have a tough time scrolling on that. But um, from here, we can actually see if I go in, unfortunately, because I'm on my second screen, I go into full screen, and it doesn't want to cooperate. So we're just going to make do with this. Um, again, this is from ADSI Edit. Let me just show you how we get there. Um, I just go to Start, ADSI Edit. And thank you for letting me know that, Wendy. Um, so here we have our organization, our um, domain. If I had multiple domains, I could um, connect to them here. But again, we're just grabbing that search base uh, where, in essence, if I wanted to lock it down to anything under users and below, then I could just grab that um, uh, under here. We have our distinguished name. Um, we could just grab that here, copy and paste that um, into here. But I just want to go ahead, for the purposes of this demonstration, just authenticate everyone in my watchguard-lab.com uh, domain and underneath that. We also have a group string as well, the end of searching uh, user, password of searching user. Uh, we don't need that for most cases. And then the login attribute, again, the defaults are going to be just great for this. But we want to just go ahead and set up the IP address. And again, anytime that you can secure your organization by um, enabling LDAP-S, 
I would uh, encourage you to do that simply for a, um, a security uh, standpoint. So in this case, we have the authentication um, servers, the WatchGuard Lab. If I want to set up additional ones, I could do that as well. So let's just say I want to set up a personal email or a personal or, um, organization. I could simply do that by adding multiple um, domains here. And let's just go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and type in this. And I'll show you the power of being able to have multiple domains in here. So in that case, we have watchcard-lab, and then we have a bloomheart.com domain. Go ahead and uh, click OK. Now the next step from that is to start, we have the Active Directory component tied in, but we haven't really leveraged it because we don't have any users and groups tied in from Active Directory over to that. So the next step is um, we want to go ahead and grab some users. Now you can um, create, for instance, if you wanted to, create a new uh, container or a new, um, let's just say in this case, we wanted to make a new group. We want to call it WatchGuard SSL uh, VPN users. We want to make it a security group, global, that's fine. And now from here, I can go ahead and add in users on the fly that I want to be able to um, VPN in. So rather than go and touch my firewall every time someone gets hired or fire, fired, I can simply, um, chances are you're probably doing work in Active Directory anyway, or maybe creating a template for them. So now we can simply add in users that we want to be able to authenticate into um, anyone in this U group is going to be added into um, uh, the firewall. So now what we can do is we want to go ahead and grab this group. So again, I just hit F2. That allows me to select the name, again, that's going to take out any chance of spelling or typos or case sensitivity. And now I can go into my firewall, set up authentication, authorize users and groups. And now I can add in that uh, group. Now, one of the um, best use cases as well for having multiple scenarios is that we can specify uh, either one domain controller or we can specify um, another. Or we could say if any um, domain controller has this group, we're going to be able to authenticate um, a user. So again, great way for organizations to have multiple uh, domains in it that you don't want to necessarily um, manage all these instances. We can just say any authentication server that has this group, we're going to be able to create policy for it. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually take it one step further from a security standpoint and say, you know what, let's go ahead and enable login limits for each user or group. So certainly when we talk about more um, secure environments that are running credit cards or financial data, uh, we can go ahead and limit those logins, uh, limits for each user, allow unlimited uh, concurrent firewall authentication logins from the same account, or we could say let's limit it to one, and then we're going to reject a subsequent login, or we're going to allow subsequent logins and log off the first session. So depending on your environment, you might find that uh, to be useful for you. So now I've created authorized users and groups. I want to go ahead and create one more for the sample of this um, demonstration. Let's just say we want to make a new group called uh, Bank Tellers. So I'm just going to create um, a Bank Tellers group and then create a new group as well called Bank Managers. Um, so if we come under here, we have Bank Managers. So two, two additional groups. Now this is for the purpose of creating different policies depending on your uh, group. Um, so from here, we're going to go ahead and, uh, again, just copy and paste each one of those out, set up authentication, um, authorize users and groups, and we're going to add in that group. Now, if I wanted to, um, a great uh, way as well as if you wanted to tie in individual users, um, on there you could just click on this and it's going to tie in individual users. Um, but I'm going to create a group for bank tellers and bank managers. Now we have two of those groups on the firewall. Now we can um, take it again from that default policy of any trusted, 
and I haven't done much on this policy as you can see here. Um, so if you have uh, critiques or criticisms, I have, again, this is a pretty vanilla firewall um, policy set. So from here, we're going to create, um, and what I would recommend is creating a different name for your different group. Now, depending on what you uh, would like to call it, uh, that's up to you. But I would ha encourage you to have a consistent uh, naming scheme in your environment. Now, rather than from any trusted, as I mentioned, um, we can go in and click on Add. Now, if you haven't checked out um, the new, uh, well, we call it FQDN or fully qual qualified domain names, we can now add that in as, um, uh, for instance, Startup Microsoft. So we can build policy and allow anything, for instance, going to Office 365 and create a specific policy for that. Um, that was just out. I'm very excited. Um, a lot of you have been asking for that. Uh, so we just delivered, again, fully qualified domain names. In this case, going back on task, um, we can now look at authorized users and groups. As I mentioned, we have uh, our firewall group, users and groups, and we can go ahead and specify, for instance, bank um, and managers for this policy. Now, what I would really recommend, a lot of people ask, um, how do you build policy or how would you suggest building policy for all of your um, organizations? And again, coming out of an um, educational environment, I would really encourage every one of you to look at your most restrictive group, build that policy, and then simply copy um, or create duplicates of that policy, and then simply let up your um, restrictions from there. So whether or not you're some organizations might be concerned with um, users surfing adult material. Um, in my educational environment, my um, most restricted group was my um, kindergartners and then my uh, mobile devices. So obviously in those environments, I locked them down to all sorts of websites. I um, did app control, blocking them to, um, for instance, peer-to-peer -peer or um, uh, remote access um, paths. Fortunately, we didn't have too many kindergartners um, trying to hack the firewall. But um, so again, build the policies based on your most restrictive group. So in this case, um, I would suggest starting out with bank tellers, creating application control from there, and say, you know what, we don't want them to be able to get to maybe it's games. And again, from here, I would really recommend that you go into select by category. You say, you know what, they shouldn't be allowed to get to bypass proxies. And again, if you haven't checked out the code on this, um, the latest uh, firmware version, we now allow you, rather than just drop or allow, to simply say, you know what, you get two megabits per second or 10% of the available bandwidth, simply because streaming media is such a bandwidth hog out there, and we recognize the power of having uh, streaming media in an organization, but we don't want it to overrun your, um, or in your case, you probably don't want it to overrun your business uh, critical application. And you, you can simply al allow that by um, your traffic management. And again, I covered that under a different series. You can view that on our YouTube channel. But in this case, we want to go ahead, again, select by category. I want to allow or deny based on my bank managers. I can then go into my web blocker and say, um, let's create a new policy for that create a policy for uh, my bank tellers. And again, maybe I'm not concerned with web um, or adult material, but I would recommend that you look at this. Um, again, if you've uh, been on another Firebytes, uh, you probably heard me um, talk about this locking down the security channel. So um, as I mentioned before, I had, for instance, CryptoLocker downloaded in my environment to look at the effects of it on my machine. Because I had security blocked, and more specifically, this advanced malware command and control, it did not allow um, the ransomware to grab those encryption keys and encrypt my file. So whether or not you're concerned with all this other um, categories, make sure that you have a security um, checked under your web blocker categories. It's going to be a, um, a perfect way to um, just, a, again, that layered defense against, um, unfortunately, the ransomware that's um, running out there. So, again, we have bank managers, um, from bank managers to any external. 
and we can go ahead and click OK on that, which I can't get to my OK button. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and cancel that. Now, in the case where I had said um, the 4100 outbound, um, we have the pre-built policy for that. So we're talking about watch guard authentication. Now, if you're familiar with this, and again, anything that you can do through policy manager, you can do with a web GUI. But from here, we have watch guard authentication port 4100. Now we could say, you know what, we want to be able to manage a firewall externally. So rather than having just any trusted, any optional, obviously if you're internal to the firewall, you're going to be able to manage it. But now you can just add in that group of, um, so we're going to add other, we're going to choose bank managers. Um, I know a number of you are saying, well, gosh, hopefully bank managers are managing my firewall. Um, this is just an example of how to add a group into um, the WatchGuard authentication. And then they can just hit port 4100 uh, externally, authenticate as, um, let's say, Johnny, that's a member of bank managers, and then they have access to your firewall. So the other case, obviously, is that we're just building a, um, a policy now for we have the bank managers. Now we can just add in another policy and then simply hit the duplicate um, this button for clone. We can do that for application control. As I mentioned, you're taking your most restrictive set, creating a clone, and then you're loosening it up. And certainly you can um, do that through the clone method as well. So the next step is, um, as I mentioned, tying into a VPN. So if we just go into VPN, most of you are aware WatchGuard does IPsec um, through a sh uh, any IPsec client you have. Um, we uh, have a download for the Shrewsoft um, the client. What I would recommend, uh, simply because I'm on the road quite a bit uh, traveling, and a lot of networks don't play well with IPsec, I use almost solely this SSL client, um, activate uh, mobile VPN with SSL. Now, depending on your environment, you might talk about uh, routing all VPN traffic through there. You can force all traffic through the tunnel. Now, in my case, um, I love doing this because if I'm in a coffee shop and join in their Wi-Fi, I don't want people snooping on my traffic. So simply by forcing all client traffic through the tunnel, I spin up that uh, VPN session on my iPad or my iPhone um, or Android for that matter. It's going out securely. No one's able to listen to it. And if I go to what is my IP, it's going to be my office IP address because I'm forcing all client traffic through that tunnel. Now, I've had a lot of questions recently on how we can lock down. Um, for instance, let's say Johnny needs to have access to one or two inside resources. You could specify those allowed resources here. Or what you can do is build policy based on um, Johnny, and then that's going to apply whether or not he's um, coming in on a VPN or um, through external as well. We can come under authentication uh, server settings here. Now, as I mentioned, one of the powers of uh, WatchGuard being able to specify multiple domain names, you can have multiple domains as well through uh, SSL VPN. Now, what you can do is tie in different defaults. So as you see here, we can um, click on for instance, Firebox um, database, we can make WatchGuard-Lab uh, the default. That really comes into play when they hit the authentication portal on there. And then we can um, tell it uh, uh, the groups as well on here. So if we wanted to tie in the groups, um, we can tie that group in as well. Let me grab it, um, the group that I have here. I'm going to tie that in. And now anyone in this group is going to be able to um, uh, authenticate against my firewall. Now, just so everyone's clear, as I keep mentioning the port 4100, I'm going to show you um, what that is. So if you did have an outside uh, IP address or domain, you could tie that in here. You can um, then go to port 4100. I don't have my certificate signed um, simply because it is a test environment, but in this case, as I mentioned, um, the power of being able to make it the default is going to select that WatchGuard-Lab as the default. I'm going to type in my uh, username and password, and it's going to um, authenticate here. 
Now, some of the tips and tricks that I have um, was mentioning I would show you is to look and be able to test that uh, Active Directory integration. Now, as we look at a firewall, again, this is running 11.10.1, um, the newest code. Uh, I think this is going to be released fairly soon here. But looking at, um, for instance, the system status, we can look at the authentication uh, list so we can see the users authenticated into my firewall. I can go ahead and log them off if I wanted to do that. I can also do that through um, the WatchGuard. Um, let me just show you through the um, Firebox System Manager. Many of you are um, still using the Windows side of things. It's great. We have the authentication list here, which we see the same users. We can log them off here as well. So anything that you can do, um, pretty much anything on the firewall on the policy manager side, you could do through the web. Now, one of the tips and tricks about the web that I love is being able to come under your server connection and be able to test out the connection to your LDAP server. So in the instance that you can't get that link to work, um, maybe you're in an environment where your um, domain controller is uh, locked down through the internal firewall, this allows you to be able to test out uh, users and groups. Um, a test connection, we see the login, um, see OK, it's um, the user's authenticated. And now we can actually get the group membership. So in the instance that we wanted to find out why a, a group wasn't applying successfully in the firewall, maybe it's that the administrator user wasn't part of a, a specific group. And we can go ahead and um, create that group as well here. But again, this is going to um, just be that integration component, uh, tying your firewall into Active Directory. And then next time, as we look at the power of being able to leverage, taking that one step further so that we can identify, seamlessly identify users based on that uh, single sign-on component um, so that we have that, rather than users having to hit port 4100 internally, we can now um, seamlessly identify those. We can also, as I mentioned, one of the um, last things we'll cover today is how to manage your internal users and roles group from here. So let's just go ahead and take a look at that as well. We can now specify users, um, users and roles in the internal firewall. Um, we can also tie directly into your authentication server. And we can give um, maybe your network engineers different roles in your environment. So we could say uh, they're simply a device monitor, um, or maybe it's a device administrator, guest administrator. So we can tie directly into um, a specific um, user uh, through Active Directory this way. So again, just a great way to be able to integrate Active Directory um, so that we have, if users are changing their passwords on the Active Directory, now they can log in with a changed password on the WatchGuard firewalls. So with that, I um, want to bring this uh, session to a close. Again, I, my apologies for having that screen resolution too small for you. Um, I did resolve that. Hopefully you're able to follow along. We will post that uh, shortly on the uh, WatchGuard channel. And if you haven't uh, checked this out, feel free to subscribe. It's just youtube.com forward slash WatchGuard. NW for Northwest. Uh, those videos are posted there. Or you can uh, reach out to me or uh, your, if you're from a different region, your um, respective uh, sales engineer. But again, if you have any topics, any suggestions, um, or topics for future Firebyte sessions, let us know. I'm glad to work that into a schedule. And Wendy will send out the um, uh, messaging for that so that you can get signed on. But my apologies for running slightly over today. We just want to make sure that um, we're maximizing your time, um, allowing you to grab some quick uh, tidbits of information, learn how to leverage your WatchGuard um, infrastructure even further. So just as a recap, next Firebytes, Friday, July 24th, it's going to be over integrating single sign-on um, from there. So with that, that being said, want to wish you a great uh, Friday. Have a great weekend. And until next time, 
Uh, we'll see you on integrating single sign-on with WatchGuard. I'm Johan Blumhart, sales engineer for WatchGuard. See you next time.